um, I hid the um, the past sessions um, on the YouTube live stream link, so that way people don't go on the right one. So now, um, how many people are in here now? Thirty two. Hey there, everybody. Um, okay, so we're already live on on YouTube. Just wanted to say, we're good to go. Awesome. Just want to double check if the hosts are here. Jesse, how are you feeling, my friend? Um, for everyone who doesn't know, Jesse, I think, is officially the earliest uh, time zone out of us being based in California. <laughs> I'm good. Always ready. <laughs> and I probably am not the earliest time frame, but, but I'll take it. <laughs> well, I think... From here, everyone gets later until it becomes early tomorrow, but I think you're the most in the past, unless there's someone west of you. I'm just one hour behind Jesse in mountain time, and I'm just running on pure adrenaline right now. There was a guest who was from New Zealand, so that was kind of early for them. Like wow. Five in the morning, I think. The next day? <laughs> yeah. I can't work it out. <laughs> wow okay so we're just going to wait for some of the um hosts to come in and so we can start um closing recaps and takeaways from each of the sessions i was able to kind of toggle back and forth between the different rooms and there was so much information overload my brain is going crazy um but we wanted to do a recap from each room and hear from everyone um, so that way, um, we all kind of know what's going on. And uh, Lucas requested to go first um, from the Food Sovereignty in Spanish, but I don't see him. Um, I'd love to share something while we oh, wait yes, for Lucas. Um, I had a, a thought coming through a few times as I was trying to, you know, move around and travel around rooms and, and absorbing um, all the, the the effort, all the all the kindness, all the, the the love, really that everybody put into their presentations, and of course the the overarching structure led by Natalie and Donna um, and all patrons. It's it's just been wonderful. And a couple of times I thought, and I wanted to invite you to to eventually see if you felt something like that and and tune into that sensation, which is that I was feeling in body an excitement right like in the belly right there's this excitement this bubbling up um that felt amazing like i even closed my eyes at some point and just tuned into the sensation of all this effort all this collaboration genuine from the heart collaboration happening simultaneously in different parts of the world and we're all tuning into this and we have this we have to choose what we want and we're creating maybe between 12 and 15 hours of content in the past three hours um and i just wanted to tune into that to share that this has been very special uh but also if anyone else felt this sensation i i don't know i, I kind of want to put a name on it and i feel it's um, you know, it's it's community co-creation. It's it's the the, the force of, of the creative force of community. Let's say um, that has uh, been emerging with all of you putting your hearts and, and time into this. And so, just wanted to show gratitude. Um, and uh, and yeah, what an amazing amount of, of brilliance and, and wisdom we've been kind of uh, sharing all over. So grateful for that. Awesome. Sounds great. Um, could be wrong, but I still don't see Lucas. So we can just go ahead and get started with anyone, um, any of the note takers or any of the hosts want to recap their rooms first. Donna, Lucas is on now. Go Lucas. Oh, Lucas. oh perfect. Amazing. <laughs> 
<ríe> Lucas. Hola. You're on, Lucas. You, you, get, to you get to share your takeaway first. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> we're okay. We're, we're waiting for you. <laughs> You're famous. Uh, bueno, voy a hacerlo en español. Eh, nuestra conferencia era en español. Se llamaba eh, Soberanía Alimentaria. Y quiero compartir algunas reflexiones eh, bien interesantes. Eh, lo primero es que eh, la soberanía alimentaria eh, va mucho más allá de simplemente el alimento. Eh, también nos propone que debamos eh, ser soberanos en nuestro conocimiento. Y de ahí eh, sale una serie de reflexiones acerca de cómo eh, nosotros como latinoamericanos eh, podemos eh, repensar nuestra identidad más allá como de estas proteras eh, sociopolíticas que han sido creadas hace poco. Eh, la soberanía alimentaria también eh, no se autodefine, eh, es algo que está cambiando y que reconoce la pluralidad del ser y el hacer. Y en ese orden de ideas, eh, la diversidad de discursos eh, es como la biodiversidad de la naturaleza misma. Eh, y en ese orden de ideas hay que entender que la soberanía alimentaria propone que eh, la biodiversidad es un derecho colectivo que todos tenemos. Y eh, como decía Hernando Chindoy, eh, un indígena Kamchá que nos acompañó y dio su testimonio, eh, él nos invita a que mientras vivamos, vivamos bien y vivamos bonito. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Lucas. Who would like to continue off of that? I can speak about the English Food Sovereignty Room next. Um, in our group, we talked about, we started by speaking about the importance of language, um, that language is political and words have power. Um, so we need to be intentional in describing issues of privilege and sovereignty. And one example of that being the, the choice of the term food apartheid over food desert um, to point out that this is a human caused issue and not a natural phenomenon. Um, we also looked at food sovereignty as a kind of a confluence of three elements, um, security being uh, sufficient physical and economic access to food uh, the safety of the available food supply, and then uh, community control over how food is produced. Um, one piece of that is we spend a lot of time talking about land access, that land equals food and access to arable land uh, equates to more equitable control over um, the food system, and that solutions to food sovereignty may come in part from the land access space and, and making a more just system of access to growing space. Um, we also touched briefly on the impacts of COVID on the food supply chain workforce, um, the outsized impacts of the pandemic on minority workers, uh, particularly in the meatpacking industry, and that this is something we can all be keeping our eyes on and paying attention to as the uh, pandemic continues. Um, and then in the group discussion, we got to hear how some of these issues play out locally in um, Seattle, Indonesia, Denmark, and the Philippines. And my favorite takeaway from that, from the discussion, um, was a, a new idea to me, but the idea of an enclosed activism um, that privileged people can take actions that may feel like food justice, like shopping at a farmer's market, only because they have the capital and the privilege to do so but that, that may not be in fact uplifting a less privileged community. Um, so I hope that coming away from this event that we'll all continue thinking about how privilege and prejudice function um, and what we can all do to acknowledge those issues um, and take action that will bring food sovereignty to more people. Thanks. Thank you, Megan. It sounds like that room had a lot going on and a lot to learn. So can't wait to look at that room after. Uh, let's continue on with uh, Veronica, I believe, or Yersenia, do you guys want to uh, speak about your room? Mm. Uh, shall, I, shall I do this in, in English? 
es un Spanish. Natalia. My, the key points, should I tell them in English or in Spanish? I don't know what to do. Go, go ahead and um, did you guys leave the whole room in Spanish? Feel free yeah. to do that. Okay, okay. Voy, voy a hacerlo en castellano. Eh, ya mandaré eh, puntos o ya lo traducimos de alguna manera. Vale. Eh, en la sala se ha mencionado que es importante saber eh, qué clientes tienes. Eh, Y para poder explicarles de dónde viene el producto, ¿vale? Y cómo ellos muestran un trato directo entre, cómo ellos tienen un trato directo, cómo lo realizan, ¿no? Y cómo llegan a ellos para poder saber y aprender sobre el producto, lo que, lo que, cómo lo producen, cómo lo pueden utilizar, qué valores nutricionales tienen, cómo se puede utilizar en alta, en alta cocina. Eh, eso es eh, una, de, una de las cosas que se ha mencionado. También en ese, en ese, a ese nivel de industria. <coughs> También se, se menciona de que ese tipo de alimentos, eh, ese tipo de labores eh, encarecen, encarecen el producto. Por lo tanto, muchas veces solo son accesibles para cierto nivel de gente. ¿de acuerdo? Entonces, mi pregunta ahí es cómo se hace, cómo podemos hacer para, para hacer un sistema más inclusivo. Luego también Guillermo ha nombrado, igual Guillermo y creo que los tres, eh, Guillermo, Lucas y Juan, han nombrado algo que nunca había escuchado, que es eh, llamar a los alimentos productos, o llamar, en vez de llamarlo producto, llamarlo alimento. Y me parece algo bastante remarcable porque al final lo que tú compras es un alimento que te nutre, ¿vale? Entonces había que marcar ahí la diferencia ¿no? de cómo comunicamos, cómo comunicamos la comida. Eh, eso es, ahí creo que es, ahí es una... De igual deberíamos cambiar el léxico de cómo decimos las cosas. Eh, Luego, ¿qué más hemos dicho? Eh, hemos hablado de trazabilidad, de, local, de, lo, de cómo, qué es local y qué, es no, qué, qué no es local. Eh, ¿Cómo podemos conseguir que sabes si un producto es 100% local? ¿no? Luego, eh, Yesenia ha mencionado que le he preguntado que ella enseña a un nivel educativo universitario y le ha preguntado a ver qué tipo de. O sea, yo no sabía que, eh, a qué nivel ejercía, ¿no? Entonces, claro, ese nivel de educación, de producto, de, 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 de uso de técnica, de todos los beneficios que ella tiene, está solo accesible a cierto grupo de gente, ¿no? Entonces, es, es, tenemos otro problema de accesibilidad a, a, a educación, ¿no? Entonces, ahí otra, otra cosa en la que igual se debería también empezar a trabajar, ¿no? ¿Cómo podemos hacer que, que ese conocimiento ancestral tan beneficioso para el ecosistema pueda volver usado, puede volver usado y puede, que nos, eh, nos traiga unos, unos valores que son muy necesitados hoy en día. Y luego, eh, ¿qué más? Eh, pues la verdad que chicos, hemos hablado de bastantes cosas súper interesantes. Yo... Eh, me ha gustado mucho cómo eh, se han enfocado más en dar valor al producto instead of, perdón, cómo dar valor al producto, en vez de hablar, un, un restaurante se enfoca más a, a highlight, el valor de un producto, en vez de hacerse ver, mostrar el ego de lo que un restaurante puede hacer para cambiar un producto que parezca bonito. Vale, entonces, eh, eso es algo que uf, me ha chocado mucho, pero los tres, eh, uf, si podíamos, yo creo que... Wow, eh, una sala muy bonita. Muchas gracias, chicos. Gracias, Vero, a todos los que hablaron y compartieron en esa sala. And now, if we could go to Eleni for the English version. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so, we had uh, Dag McMaster from Silo in London joining us and Dr. Johnny Drain an expert on fermentation, food design, and material science. So we had a holistic approach to the systems of food in terms of the chain from farmers to the chefs and how everyone can co-create together. So inviting scientists, entrepreneurs to join the conversation in creating this system with no loose ends as um, 
Doug describes it. So we looked at the notion of sustainability and how it has sort of lost its sense these days because it's a term that's overused and used to cover up other um, uh, impacts of the industry. We looked at the degenerative systems that we suffer from these days and the reason behind that. So large companies owning crops and uh, um, controlling their taste and uh, monocultures across the world and the food chain. And then uh, B talked us through uh, ancestral wisdom and indigenous uh, preparation methods uh, and ingredients as well. And that's when we came to see what chefs and what other uh, activists can do in this spectrum um, like uh, Johnny being a scientist. So I don't know if B would like to join me here and uh, talk us through some of the points that were raised in the Q&A part and some yeah. key highlights from the discussion. Yeah, thanks Eleni. Yes, so um, there were great questions. Um, there was a lot of excitement about the potential of making change from every bite we take as an educational act. Um, but Johnny brought up, you know, that nature is our guide and a lot of the indigenous um, and ancestral knowledge is so strong in regeneration because it um, rests and it's embedded with nature. It works with nature. So that came through with Johnny. Um, also, Charles came in and talked about the importance of friendship and how that makes change, you know, human friendship and then friendship with other species and also nature. So friendship came through as an important element in the Q&A. Um, particularly questions on, uh, there was one interesting one on how abrupt uh, changes in the food chain, uh, like Brexit and like the lockdowns in, recently in England, how did um, Doug McMaster and Silo cope with that abrupt uh, change with the food that was being supplied. Um, he replied that they could, they had a lot of orders and then there was the lockdown and that they cooked all the, the food they had, they fermented all the food they had so it wouldn't go to waste. Um, there was another really good question about um, could fishing uh, culture be regenerative like agriculture? And again, Doug um, answered that with uh, the ways that fish are caught and the being in tune with the fish and, um, you know, letting them have time to breed, making sure you don't, you know, you let them um, have a, a good life cycle. So it was very, very similar to, to land uh, produced foods. Mm -hmm. um, and then the lastly, for, there, was got, there were some other questions. I think one of the two more things, one was about how to bring zero waste uh, eating to the masses. And both Johnny and Doug talked about how you make it a story. You tell, you tell it. So in a restaurant setting, it's a story and everything um, is, is in your, what you eat and what you see and what you talk about. And then finally, a couple of requests through the Q&A uh, chat box were, which I think is quite interesting for the community is a resource, some resources. So they asked, someone asked about, are there films and books you can recommend um, and things like that. So yeah, the idea that there's a sort of a resource bank of, of things that uh, the community uh, can recommend. Mm -hmm. And if I may just add lastly here, be um, the zero waste cooking school that Doug started yeah, in. Yeah. Just phenomenal. It's the world's first waste cooking school and is broadcasted um, by YouTube and it's so accessible uh, to the whole world to get inspired and follow simple recipes at home. So only if more chefs and activists and scientists like uh, Dad and Johnny could follow these practices, the world would definitely become a better place. Um, thank you from us. Thank you. And continuing on, could we uh, have maybe Mags or Ed, would you want to go on? Uh, yeah, I can uh, recap um, and then I'll let Ed recap um, 
So I started with, um, let's see, basically the idea that agrarian shift has is the idea that it that it exists, which it, it's not real. We've actually never really moved away from an agrarian society or culture because we're, we rely on food. Um, what's really happened is that because of what has shifted, we rely on peasant farmers and migrant labor and industrial farms, which um, are a failure um, and just pollute and um, a lot of a lot of farmers in the US are poor um, and actually are subsidized. Um, and it's just a big industry. Um, and then you, we looked at like, um, not just the agrarian shift, but to approach like um, the fact that there was a diaspora uh, movement of people from lands, from their lands and how um, knowledge was interrupted because of this. Um, indigenous practices was were interrupted because of this. Um, and then I went on to talk about, you know, reclaiming, because I was using the word reclaiming, I needed to, I needed to approach that um, because using that word is a very specific word and like we all live on in the US <laughs> stolen land. So um, um, just finding sovereignty in food. Um, so after I did a slideshow, um, the slideshow was basically um, structures of urban farms, um, business structures. Um, like nonprofits and NGOs um, and businesses, um, and then different growing techniques on urban farms and agriculture, which involves like huge buildings, like agri um, um, agri architectural um, buildings that integrate agriculture. Um, and then just stuff, Jason actually asked a question, like if someone doesn't have any money or any land, which is, you know, a huge problem because we live in such a capitalist economy and systemic racism exists. And um, there's just so many barriers for so many people. And his question was like, if you have no money and no land, like how do you do it? And so guia gardening is one approach um, among a few besides the uh, structured plot systems that uh, ha are exist around the United States. Um, sorry, words are hard. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I just, uh, slideshow of that and different structures. And I will have that on the patron drive. There's a lot of information and links on those uh, slideshows. Um, uh, yeah, and then Ed went on to uh, talk about engineering and I'll, I'll give it to Ed before I give it to Ed though. Like um, one of the things that I, I approached was how urbanization is um, considered such a problem. And um, the thing is that I believe wholly that we can use the accelerating urbanization as a modality for accelerating food change. Um, because 80% of our food comes from outside of urban areas. And so we need to, we need to transform that. Um, so the techniques are on the slides and then um, Ed has an amazing system. Um, thank you. Um, if you, if it's, you wanna go, yeah. <laughs> So I'll, I'll kind of kind of jump in. I was actually hoping you'd, you'd summarize because I'm terrible at summarizing my own stuff. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, basically what what I talked about was um, the uh, the ability we have if if we look at uh, the abundance that natural ecosystems can create and the health benefits, the environmental benefits. Um, if we actually look at those. Um, as something that we can design with and design around. Um, we actually, uh, there, there's ways to make uh, just incredible abundance, even in a single occupant's own space, in their own yard. Um, you know, that they, they can grow their own food, they can grow mushrooms, they can grow fish, they can grow chickens, they can grow um, uh, all kinds of different things. You just have to kind of look at it the right way. And, and uh, as Mags, I was saying, I was, you know, talked a little bit about um, a Lear Garden, which is just one expression of, of this way of doing things. And a Lear Garden is, is something that's, um, it's a it's a an automated version of regenerative agriculture. So it, it borrows, uh, technology from about 12 different ways of, of uh, gardening. And I, I kind of went through those in my talk of, you know, talking about hugel culture and composting and 
aqu aquaponics and, and all of these different ways, micro-remediation, um, all of the different pieces that kind of came together to make regenerative agriculture that, you know, it's something you can put in your backyard, um, you're producing soil, you're sequestering carbon, you're producing food. The food has a, amazing nutrition. The food has amazing flavor. Um, it's very productive. Um, and so really taking that and kind of running with it and saying, well, what, what can we do um, using some of the advantages that we have in urban areas? Like, you know, how can we take um, agriculture in a new direction considering community that we have in so much abundance in an urban area that that's that's a lot more sparse in rural areas um you know you can have division of labor on a on a on a scale that you really can't do um and and all of it gets powered by abundance um and that's that's the piece that really makes me uh excited to kind of move forward in this is is you you start creating an abundance you can grow I live on a sixth of an acre and I grow more food than I can eat. Um, and, and I can do that consistently. And it's really fairly easy for me to just even generate a couple hundred dollars a month of additional income. And, and, you know, I can use that to support my local economy and feed my neighbors and, and sell food at farmer's markets and whatever, whatever I want to do. And it's, it's something that, and, and it, and that pulls uh, profits away from the industrial agriculture machine that's, poisoning our bodies and our planet. Great, thank you guys. Seems like everyone's so excited to learn about the system. Um, so thank you. Do we have Jesse or Dana or Victoria to go next? Sure, I can go. Um, thank you everyone who came to my room. Uh, for those of you who didn't, here's a summary. Um, so I opened up with privilege is not an insult. It's important that all of us recognize the privilege that we have, no matter how small it may feel. Um, denying your privilege just holds us all back. Um, it's kind of like admitting you have a problem in the first place to being able to address it. Um, <clears throat> and I did a little bit of math for fun. Um, and I wanted to remind everyone that if all of human, modern human time, so the last 200,000 years, um, were in one hour, industrialization would only have been the last 3.6 seconds. It's, it all seems very overwhelming. It all seems very large. It all seems something that we, we can't combat, but it's, it's a baby. The new industrialization and the way that we are doing things is very new and it's still a work in progress and we do have the power to change it. Um, everything, I also went over a little bit of the science-y aspect. I am a biochemistry undergrad, so sometimes I can get lost in the weeds of the science aspect of it, but everything, like everything, your pencil, your computer, your hand, it's all made of the same under 100 elements. Um, so we're all made of the same stuff and we're all made um, to, to just eat naturally. We all know to feed from our mother's breast, et cetera, and just know that food is natural. Like, and there's still, and we don't have to look far for hunter gatherers. I also discussed the Hadza of Tanzania. They are still hunter gatherers. They grow no agriculture. They have no permanent dwellings and they find their food every single day because that's their way of life. And they're not some primitive tribe. I mean, they have cell phones. They just choose to hunter and gather every single day. And they, they wear regular t-shirts and belts. Um, and they, um, it's not some mystery, we don't have to look to fossils and think, oh, how did we eat such a mystery? We eat sugar, we eat carbs, we eat proteins, we eat potatoes, we, they, just like they eat tubers, we eat beans, just like they eat legumes, like it's not hard. And it, it shouldn't be hard, but it is because of the way that capital, uh, capitalism and industrialization has turned things on us. Um, I also want to remind people that it's not your fault. It's not your fault that we don't know these things. It's not your fault what capitalism has done to you. I think a lot of us kind of, it's the Hadza tribe, H-A-D-Z-A. -A. There's lots of movies and film. I think even on Amazon Prime, um, there is a film about them. They're great. They love honey. Honey is their most favorite thing in the whole world. Um, and so that's just kind of signals how much like we love sweets It's because it's normally hard to find sweets. It's not usually looking at you when you're checking out being like, hey, Reese's. Um, so yeah, check them out. Um, and I also want to remind you all that labels are um, mis intentionally misleading. 
Um, like there was lobbies to say the sugar content on nutritional labels would to be put in grams instead of tablespoons, whereas tablespoons is more easily recognizable. Um, people would know, oh, 30 tablespoons of sugar in my Coke instead of grams. They don't know what a gram is, a paper clip. They don't know what that is. Um, and that's, that's, again, speaking to the lack of accessibility because of lack of education. Sure, some people know what grams are, but most everyday people cooking with their grandmas and their mothers in their kitchen, they know what a tablespoon is. Um, and folk, again, food is not hard. We instinctively know what to eat. We know that we need clean water. Um, and industrialization didn't have to be evil. It didn't have to be bad. It's wonderful that we have so much technology. It's amazing that we have these things. I mentioned in my presentation that the world population um, in about a hundred years jumped from 1.6 billion to 7 billion because organisms when presented with unlimited resources will just go with it. Um, and I want to remind everyone that everything is new in what we know. Uh, we didn't know that we needed to wash our hands to prevent infection until 1847. We didn't have antibacterial soap until 1984. Like we just were just learning these things. We were like, oh, we have to wash scalpels in between surgeries, that's crazy. We didn't know these things until very recently. Um, and I want to remind everyone to always be kind and to always consider the intersections that people are going through. It is disability, age, race, location, education, income status. Don't judge someone for using a paper plate because that's not sustainable because maybe it's painful for them to wash their dishes and you don't know their life. Maybe they don't have any water to wash their dishes with. Um, so just to always be mindful to be kind to each other that we're all doing our best. Well, thanks, Victoria. Then now I have to follow up <laughs> because I'm going to be probably a huge buzzkill after this uh, really fun and empowering speech. Because my my uh, the second session in the in the food privilege and how we consume uh, series, we focused more about the negative impact that we have on environments uh, as well as on communities. So some of the keywords that we mentioned there were um, biodiversity loss, deforestation, pollution, food security, but also child labor and loss of cultural uh, heritage. Um, and if we think about it, it can be really overwhelming. You know, we can think, okay, how to do the right thing? What do I actually buy? What should I not buy? And what should I consume? So I think we ended on the note that the key to addressing our impact is not to vilify uh, certain foods and is not to swear to never buy a specific thing, but really be mindful and aware of our consumer decisions. And um, we as a community can be indeed a very powerful change maker in shaping the food industry in the future. Um, and this is not only by making small individual changes, but also by influencing changes on, the, on a larger scale. Um, I think it's important to mention that in the end, if we want to make food a right and not a privilege, it probably will have to come from us and not really from the big corporations. Um, so I think it's really important that we keep that uh, into account. I would like to jump in um, and share just my thoughts and takeaways from our group as well, um, which are really simple. Um, and that is, uh, you know, they say um, sometimes that we need beauty um, more than we need food or water to stay alive. And I hope that you all uh, are leaving filled with a little bit of the beauty of the experience that we've created today, um, because uh, we need this kind of hope and this kind of gathering to um, confront these huge challenges with a spirit of, um, of joy and possibility. And, uh, and so I hope you, you leave with that little bit of beauty planted in your heart. Thanks for planting it in mind. Thank you guys for such a beautiful, elegant, like just summary of everything that went on. Um, yeah. So let's wrap it up. I think we have one more room. Uh, Joanna, do you want to go ahead? Okay. Um, oh, I'll mute myself. There we go. Okay, I'm going to try to do it in Spanish and then in English, and hopefully I won't lose anything in translation. <laughs> um, en nuestro... En nuestro grupo tuvimos una conversación muy, muy buena y muy amena en torno al impacto de los huertos urbanos en, en, en transformar eh, ciertos paradigmas sociales. 
y el enfoque fue muy, fue individual. Comenzamos con una visión histórica de cómo los modelos de desarrollo eh, a través del siglo XX en América Latina se han enfocado en, en, se han llevado a cabo de una manera que no encaja con la cultura y con los modos de interacción y con modos de vida. Um, so we started with a with an overview, you know, of uh, Latin American historical development models and how they don't really uh, respond or they don't adjust to the culture and, and worldviews in which they were developed. Y, y el enfoque eh, de los huertos urbanos fue como a, mi, a medida individual podemos transformar eh, los problemas o, o atacar los problemas, abordar los problemas que la industrialización a través del siglo XX ha creado. So uh, through the, the urban farms, uh, the urban farming, we try to address the issues um, created by industrialization models of the 20th century uh, that had an impact on you know, health, economy, culture. And, y el enfoque eh, que me pareció muy interesante con el que terminamos conversando pues, tiene que ver con algo que se ha mencionado en, otros, en otras sesiones, que es la transformación de, de identidad, en este caso la transformación de cultura. O sea, en, y, y cómo la transformación de cultura es un acto de rebeldía y, es un acto, y, y nos puede llevar hacia lo que es la descolonización. Entonces, eh, a través del de, impacto de este, de esta, de este de esa, desarrollo, ¿verdad? A través de América Latina, fue el desconectarnos de la tierra y, y verla como algo ajeno a nosotros y como ajeno al progreso y al desarrollo. Entonces, hoy en día, el, el gran reto que nos planteamos es ver a la tierra y nuestra relación a ella como parte de nuestra cultura e identidad. Cuando uno logra transformar la cultura, uno puede efectuar cambios en, en prácticas, cambios en la política, cambios en las estructuras sociales. So, okay, let me try to say that in English. <laughs> so, uh, with the, one of the very interesting things that came out of the discussion, what that has been touched upon in other, in other sessions was the transformation of identity or culture as a way of uh, addressing the, the social issues and the economic issues and the, all of the issues are basically brought about by uh, industrialization and these models of progress that we've had in, in Latin America. And so the, the big challenge um, and an exciting you know, challenge at the same time is to uh, go towards a model where we can see where culture um, inherently would see uh, the earth, uh, like the soil uh, in our connection with it as in our relationship with it as an integral part of our culture and our identity. Because once you're able to transform that piece, once you're able to transform that culture and identity, you're able to then address the most, uh, the most uh, tangible and practical issues that are attached to it. You have to change the mindset in order to to address uh, the the problem. So, we're talking about a big issue here, but we looked at a very micro, very specific way of addressing it, which is with urban farming. So, when we talked about urban farming, we looked at the the impact on mental health, especially during the pandemic. You know, the, that connection uh, with the earth, the that um, feminine energy, everyone in the group mentioned that, that feminine energy that they associate, the feeling that they associate with uh, urban farming, with, with small plots of land and, and you, our interaction with it. And, um, and then throughout the pandemic, how the, the growth and, and you know, the, the, the prevalence of um, urban farms, especially at home, Uh, we talked about different modalities be beyond the home, you know, community, schools, we, we went through the whole gamut, but especially at home, the impact that it has on building resilience and then the impact that it has in helping us stop and think about, about um, where we are, think about where we are in our lives, where we are um, in, in a society where everything happens fast, where you don't think, like somebody was saying, you don't think about 
and you know, nourishment, you think about a product that you take in and you consume and you move on and effectiveness and you know, being efficient, where when you're planting things and you're watching them grow, it's like relationships. There's not a shortcut to get you know, your final product. You have to go through the motions, you have to go through the process and you have to um, stop and reflect along the way. And, and those are values that we've, you know, that we are oftentimes divorced from just because of the society in which we live. So how through a very simple practice of urban farming, we can get back to those values. Okay, I promise I'll be quick. <laughs> eh, y lo que estaba diciendo en términos de, de hablar, hablé de la, de la transformación cultural y la descolonización a través de estas prácticas, una de las cosas que, que resaltaron fue cómo utilizar una herramienta tan asequible y tan simple como lo, lo es un huerto urbano para, eh, para lidiar con, los problem, con cierto, un cierto número de problemas sociales. Entonces nos enfocamos en diferentes tipos de huertos urbanos, pero una de las cosas que más resaltó en la conversación fue las prácticas eh, de, de siembra eh, urbana durante la pandemia y las la, eh, participantes de la conversación hablaron mucho de esta energía femenina que sale y de los valores que resaltan con esta práctica. Uno de esos valores son el, el la paciencia, el tomarse el tiempo, el conectar con esa sabiduría, que son valores que en el mundo en que vivimos hoy en día, al paso al que nos movemos, estamos muy desconectados a veces de, de la importancia de, de parar y reflexionar, del de tiempo que toma producir algo que vale la pena, el tiempo que toma eh, alimentar nuestro cuerpo, el tiempo que toma alimentar nuestra mente. Entonces cuando uno siembra y ve el proceso que es lento, y que requiere mucho cuidado, mucho amor, mucho tiempo, uno va, eh, uno va eh, inevitablemente frenando y, y te ofrece un espacio para reflexión. Y durante esta, esta pandemia hemos tenido obligatoriamente que detenernos y reflexionar. Entonces es también una ventaja y es un, es un punto eh, en el cual podemos detenernos y pensar hacia dónde nos queremos dirigir, hacia dónde queremos eh, llevar nuestra, nuestra sociedad, cómo queremos efectuar esos cambios. Entonces fuimos de lo, de lo macro a lo micro, a enfocarnos en, en cómo podemos tener un impacto individual en nuestra relación con la tierra y cómo podemos fomentar y ofrecimos recursos para cómo fomentar eso en nuestras comunidades. Uy, hablé un montón, pero haber resumido casi todo. I hope I was able to summarize. Probably didn't do a great job. So, Ariana, if there's anything I left off, please uh, feel free to, to join and share. I have nothing to add. <laughs> <You're wonderful. laughs> Gracias, Ari. Charles, do you want to continue now with the, uh, leading the closing? All right. Um, well, thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. I feel um, maybe I'm not alone in feeling that we want to go back to these uh, recordings. We want to connect further. And uh, that's the beauty of, of this collaborative uh, spirit uh, that has emerged, uh, that now we have a lot of little threads and seeds that we can keep on watering and to, to, to get better at our choices, at our words uh, and at our individual and collective actions um, moving forward. So to close, um, um, I'm super happy and honored that um, our friend Mark Brand um, uh, accepted to join us uh, to give a keynote on, um, on uh, sustainability and privilege, what this means to him uh, if you don't know Mark's work uh, yet, definitely uh, look him up. He's, he's been incredibly active both in the city um, of Vancouver, uh, but also in different parts in the US and Canada and the world, inspiring um, in ways, with ways in which uh, food um, can be a tool for, for change, for social cohesion and, uh, um, and for overcoming some of uh, the, 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 the most kind of uh, powerful injustices that we need to address uh, in, in our time. Um, and yeah, Mark, um, if you're around, feel free to take the mic and uh, I'll just leave it to you to 
um, to share whatever comes from the heart and uh, as you always do, piercing through um, the veil and, uh, uh, and inspiring. Thank you so much for, for being with us. My honor, dude. And uh, love and appreciate you. This has been exceptional to hear all these reflections and the energy within is nothing short of remarkable. So I think just to start maybe a collective breath because everybody's on 12 right now. If the amp goes to 10, we're all up here, right? Energetically, it's like, this is so much information. And what is my place in it? Which will be the constant tension of your journeys consistently, which is where's my place? Am I doing enough? Did I do enough today? Will I do enough next week? Am I using my privilege? Am I wielding it like a sword? Am I helping? Am I listening? Am I actually onboarding? Am I duplicating? Is somebody already doing this work? Have I done enough research? All of these things are constant. I promise you that. And the knowledge that you are already in it together. We talk about the mycelium, the connective tissue of the planet that is underground, that is potentially energetically around us and we can't see it. We are the mycelium of humanity. Us. We are all deeply interconnected. Who would have thought a year ago that we would be convening in these ways and that the energy would be strong enough to lead impact via a screen? I wouldn't even do a meeting this way a year ago. I would barely do a phone call. Like If I'm not meeting you in person, I'm not meeting you. This doesn't work for me. So before I talk about my work, it's important to talk about where I am. And I am on the traditional and unceded territories of the Snohomish, Squamish, Musqueam, and Sailed Tooth people. Lands that were not given up, that were stolen. The greatest genocide on the planet did not happen in Germany. It happened in North America and the Americas. Information is important. History is 10 times as so. If we don't know where we came from, how could we possibly know where we're going? We can get lost in the minutia. In the minutia of things, where does my banana come from? Important. 14,189-ish people died since you got together this morning of hunger. Which one's more important? They're both equally important. That's hard to say. Why? Because there are multiple truths. Nothing is black and white. Nothing. It's so hard for us to get stability and basis in what we're going to do. If all of these truths swirl around us, our parasynthetic is not capable of onboarding all of this at once. It doesn't know what to do and it shuts down or it pushes us into dangerous directions. Those directions can be mental health issues. They can be addiction issues. Isolation right now, this is, this is my prison. It's a beautiful one, but I've been in it for almost a year. My mental health struggles every single day because I can't touch and feel people. I'm used to being deeply in community, but I'm also deeply immune compromised. And this pandemic has shown me things I never knew were possible. All of these are a play. If any of this resonates with you, it's because we're all the same underneath this thing. Now, this shell, mine happens to be the triple apex predator. I visually identify as a white privileged male. So I can move through the world and do anything I fucking want. So what do I want to do? What do I choose to do is very important. How do I show up? How do I listen? How do I convene? And so how I do that is through multiple entities. I'm an entrepreneur by nature. I'm a chef by training, 30 plus years in the kitchen. I've opened over 13 businesses here, two blocks from where we are in the downtown east side of Vancouver, which happens to have the honors, many honors, but the distinct honor of being the largest open air drug market that operates in North America, arguably the world. Also the densest area of mental illness and homelessness per capita in a five block radius, a pressure cooker of pain. And I've been in there for 15 years. When I was a teenager, I experienced it myself. I slept in McDonald's, I slept in Walmart, I slept in bus shelters. I didn't know where to go. Mental health was a problem in my family. Addiction was a problem for me. At 30 again, I experienced a similar thing. I tried to take my own life. Couldn't find the beauty and love in the world. 
I could push it out, but I wasn't willing to accept it. All of these things create the container that allows for us our experience, where we feel triggered, our trauma creates our bias in the lens at which we approach the world. So in this neighborhood, I opened my first business in 06, and then many more for-profit, cool guy businesses, music venues, galleries, sushi restaurant, no investment, scratch made, built it all ourselves. Very important. But around us, before I knew what the word gentrification was, it's what I was doing. I was a tool of it and had no idea. I didn't even know what the definition of the word was. I looked it up and the Europeans thought it was awesome. <laughs> the North Americans, not so much. And so I changed my entire mindset in about 2011 and started to work on impact. Created one particular business. It was a 21,000 square foot food security hub before anybody was really like in understanding what that even meant. What is food security? Well, in a six block radius, if the only thing that you can access is Coca-Cola and Doritos, there's no food around. I heard you guys discuss food apartheid earlier. Normalize that forever, shall we? That is the terminology. There's no such thing as a fucking food desert. Unless you're in the middle of the Sahara. It's just not a thing. It's a term of privilege to make people who are in privilege comfortable. Now is not a time for comfort at all. Food apartheid is a systemic and deeply racist system created to continue to oppress people who have just recently in the history of our world beaten slavery. Now, if we take that terminology, are we still working for a person for a minimum wage that barely allows us to get by in a system that would sooner discard us? Yes. So food apartheid is the correct terminology, and I applaud you for using it. Food waste is something that I focus on heavily. I, I work with the UN Catalyst Program, was inducted with them last week, and I also work closely with the FAO and the Future Food Institute. If you're not aware of those uh, organizations, FFI is well worth looking up. They're, they're a leader in their field. And the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN is a, often a bunch of people talking about how important they are. Let's just cut to the chase. In many of the talks that I've attended, I spend more time listening to where somebody's from after I read their bio in the morning. I don't really care at all. I'd more hear about, rather hear about best practices like you guys have shared today. And so we last year established September 29th as Global Food Day in coalition with the EU. The reason that's important is because everybody gets very excited about food waste. They get very excited. When I talk about poverty and homelessness and the thousand meals a day we do in Vancouver and the training that we do and the grocery delivery we do, everybody thinks the solution, the silver bullet is food waste. If we're throwing away 3 billion tons or whatever the number that somebody grabs out of the air is tomorrow, then that must be the solution. Well, yeah, it's one. But nobody really wants to show how we prove it. So in June of this year, locked into this space, I decided to do a little systems design and looked into our local area. And I thought that we'd approach it with grocery. Like, let's, let's do that. You know, we make a thousand scratch meal, made meals a day. And that's always been very important to me that we don't use waste food, that we are purchasers of our own local food systems, that we support indigenous growers and local growers, and that we make that impact with our money to show people what that looks like. And that food that we provide to people who are marginalized doesn't have to be soup. It can be pulled pork on sweet mash with beautiful onions. It can be all of the things that we would want to eat at a restaurant quality sit down. That's what we do. And we've done for 10 years providing over 3 million meals. That's wonderful. What do we do to add on to that with food waste? So we, we signed up with a, a grocery store and we started to pick up on an electric tricycle all of their food leftovers. I don't want to say waste. Nobody wants to eat waste. Everybody loves to eat leftovers. They're delicious. So we take the leftovers in. We hired one person to process them. This smells great. This goes in the garbage and the compost. Pretty simple job, really. And then we've created a systems map of all of the women and children fleeing violence in the indigenous shelters within a 10 block radius. Likes, dislikes. Do you have a microwave to reheat something? Would you like a hot plate? Do you have a small fridge? We'll get you one. Don't worry about it. And since June, we've put 10 tons back into the community. We added another grocery store, one person. These solutions aren't hard. They just require not worrying about looking like an idiot doing them sometimes. 
it's not going to ever be perfect. Rapid prototyping is what we say when I teach design thinking and innovation dynamics. That's terminology. It's terminology for the privilege. I say just do some shit. Put it together. Think about it and then act. And as you act, you will figure it out and you will iterate or just change course, easier language on what that looks like. And you'll continue to make that impact. We'll be five grocery stores in a month and we'll do a hundred tons this year. The emissions that can come out of the system that would have gone into the landfill, exponential. Two people, one cook, living wages, small space. This stuff is not hard. So I don't want us to ever get caught up in the data or in the minutia because it interrupts our true purpose. It's important. Knowledge is key. And you guys have shared so, so, so much. What a gift you are to each other. What a gift you are to the mycelium of each other. It's so important. Your actions I heard called earlier. So let me just share this little analogy. It's something that I've been working on for a long time. So people come to me all the time like, chef, I want to cook with you. I want to feed the homeless. Like, first of all, all of that's a problem is a sentence. Secondly, do you know how to cook? And nine times out of 10, they're like, no, I have no idea. I'm like, so how is that helpful to me? And I mean, no offense by that, but you're going to come in my kitchen, burn yourself, cut yourself. Somebody's going to watch you babysit, teach you how to cook. That, that's of no help to me or anybody else. And God knows there's enough sandwiches in the hood. Nobody needs another shitty ham and cheese sandwich. So what do you do in the world? I'm a UX designer. That's not helpful. Yes, it is. This is an organization. Have you seen their website? It's terrible. Help them out. I'm a CPA. I'm a chartered accountant. That's not helpful. Have you seen the books of the social impact business? Go help these people. I did that for five years. It's fine. But eventually, I was like, there's a need to design here for. What is that need? And that need is people just want to cook because they want to feel that they're in it and they believe that cooking is easy enough. They believe enough that it's easy that they could do it. So we bring groups of 15 people in and train them how to cook for 75. Batch cook together. They're all in a room. They hang out. They learn about the ease of cooking because truly it is easy with some direction and the provision of it. And then we set up our diner down here on the downtown east side and we feed 75 indigenous folks, women and children fleeing violence, particularly living in shelter or an SRO, single room occupancy. And the people who cook serve them too. And that's what we call soft advocacy. This talk is not soft. This is me, you know, keeping people accountable. A lot of people just shut down when they hear it. They're like, I don't need this shit in my life. But if you put them in a place where they can interact with each other and be in purpose, they never ever look at it the same. So we created an advocate factory. We don't tell you what you're going to feel. It's not my job. My job is to put you in a situation that has been designed for you to explicitly be able to access in a safe way what it looks like to be impoverished, what it looks like to come from marginalization, racism, what it looks like. And when you're in that conversation, I like to focus on kids. It changes. There's no way to go backwards because you feel it. You could watch a hundred YouTube videos and never feel a goddamn thing. But if you're in the space, you change. So for you, I think the most important thing is I love Venn diagrams. I think they're fascinating. I love to see them. I love to study them. I love when people share them with me. And for you unfamiliar with the terminology, three circles. And then the centerpiece is you in this particular design. The first question you have to ask yourself, because there's so much information. Is it agriculture? Is it food waste? Is it poverty? Is it racism? Is it food? Holy shit. It's all of it. Which one is yours? Which one is yours? And when you ask yourself that question, Journal it down and then figure out which one resonates and then ask yourself why until you feel like you're going to scream. Ask yourself over and over and over again, why do I care about this? For me, what it turned out to be after all the success and words and all the things was I lived it. I didn't want to admit that because it wouldn't be good for my CEO image. Oh, bullshit. But what really drives me around homelessness and poverty and hunger is I don't want anybody to feel as unsafe as I did. That's my driving why. So that pushes me forward every day and is like rocket fuel for me. Once I identified it and honored it, I honored young me. I honored addict me. I honored mental health advocate me. I honored that person versus hiding that person. So that's just my why. Then I had to ask myself very, very explicitly, how much time do I have for this? I went back to cooking. Nobody even knew me as a cook in this city. 
I started cooking when I was nine, but I was a business guy. And so I started hosting dinners and bringing people together and using my tools again in the kitchen and falling back in love with food personally. So it was filling that up for me. And then we started to see the impact. And so my life started to be changed in design until that was my whole life within a three-year period. Those two are crossing over, cooking, convening, hunger, poverty, together. The last part about that really is what is the skill? What is a skill that you wish you could use more every single day in advocacy that you have? Not something somebody said you were good at or a job that you once had. Those, they can be that, but it doesn't have to be. Something that you love doing. I don't care if it's crocheting booties for kittens. Kittens have cold feet. Whatever it is, you would genuinely show up for it if you deeply care about it. I lost a, kid, a kitten when I was young. I have six hours a week on a Thursday to do this, and this is what it is. In the food system, what is your role? What does it look like to show up in that? And then the most important part of all of this is, what is an organization that I could potentially be in service to? Not one that services my ego, not one that services my Instagram, one that I can be in service to. And how do you find that out? You don't call them and waste their time. Nobody has time for that shit. Don't email them and ask them 100 questions in 10 paragraphs. Nobody has time to read that. You find out by doing your own research and spending your time and your investment into finding out what they could potentially need. Then, in a very pointed way of messaging, I can offer you five hours a week and Thursdays doing this skill to help you achieve these goals, which I know are central to your purpose. Would you do me the honor of allowing me to show up in service for you? I promise you there's only one feeling greater than being in service to community having a child. Outside of that, you will feel no fuller ever than being in purpose to others. It is the thing that drives us and makes it all make sense. The rest of the time, we're just spinning. We're trying to figure it out. But when we live our life in purpose, truly in purpose, whether it be two hours a week or 200, it really changes the way that we feel. Thank you for listening and hanging out with me. Mark, thank you so much. I feel you've you've really touched us with your share um, and with your, as I said, <laughs> you managed to pierce through the veil and and get to to the heart and to to I don't know bringing is the, the, this wisdom to us right now. I mean, I, I'm I'm trying to find my words. So thank you for that, Mark. Um, and um, well, in theory, we are. Um, out of time and this is the end but i'm pretty sure that some of us want to stay and so um would be lovely to whoever wants to stay mark if you have some time some more time as well but i know you have a busy schedule if you need to go so much gratitude for for what you just shared um and you're getting tons of love on the chat um, and, and and yes you are a great inspiration for for us all or at least for me and talk from the eye perspective um, you are a great inspiration for me and, uh, and I look forward to see what, how we can collaborate and how we can share this wisdom um, to each other um, in community. I feel you touched on something fundamental um, for us, right? On the individual level, but also on how it is not that hard to do right. Um, we are inheriting a food system that was created from colonialism. There would be no French pastry without slavery, right? There would be no sugar and no French pastry, no macaron without slavery. We inherit um, a restaurant world that was born out of monarchy, right? There would be no restaurants um, born in France in the 18th century um, without uh, injustice, like, and without monarchy, without that kind of um, pyramidal structure that we're still today trying to understand and evolve from, right? There would be no restaurants and no food scene and no food system as we are, there would be no 8 billion people on this planet if it weren't for industrialization. There's a good side to that. There's a limit. But something I wanna take away and amplify from what you shared, Mark, um, and from what everyone making this moment possible, um, from you know Donna and Natalie giving so much heart and all the patrons, is that let's embrace discomfort. 
if we want to change, it must be uncomfortable. And at the same time, let's dress that discomfort with compassion, with empathy, with beauty, so we can make it an enjoyable ride. But we cannot shy away from the truth, from the fact that we are living some of the greatest crimes today, still. Thank you for bringing, Mark, um, the awareness also to the land where you are. I am here in Bacata, um, in, from Wisca territories, where there was also a cultural genocide. And, uh, and we're still not even aware of this sometimes. We even forgot the trauma that our ancestors got to deal with. So not forgetting and seeing how together in community, we can find these solutions. We can feed each other this nectar of communitas, of community, of being together and of trying to do best for ourselves, for our communities and for the everything. Um, so with that, uh, Mark, I'm not sure if you want to build on that, or but right now I would just like to open this space. This is not really about Mark or myself or anyone else uh, owning the stage. Um, it is our space, 60 of us here uh, in presence. Um, so yeah, if you want to share, if you want to maybe let's keep it kind of orderly, raise your hand. Uh, I'm happy to moderate um, or eventually someone Beautiful. else wants to help. But, yeah, brother, yeah, I mean, if I can add and just make a, a very quick offer, I, I did post somewhere where you guys can find me on socials because I will have to jump off in about 18 minutes and 10 seconds. But before I do, I am more than happy to take any questions that anybody has and expand on anything. Um, if that's helpful or of service to the container, if not, just happy to be a participant. Victoria, please. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Mark, um, for being a, a white man and acknowledging the struggle of all the indigenous people and putting such an infinite um, emphasis on native land and <clears throat> all the harm that we have they have done to us. Um, and also thank you for normalizing your depression and sharing that you almost took your own life. Um, I've struggled with that as well. And I say now that nothing can scare me because I've gone through the worst things. Um, so I'm just excited mm -hmm. about learning and I really appreciate you normalizing that because not enough people are comfortable with sharing just very real things, emotion about being people stuck in a world full of capitalism. Yeah, yeah. And just a little bit on that. Thank you for your shares. I particularly enjoyed your um, your summation earlier. Um, your energy is undeniable and uh, yeah, you're a star. So thank you for sharing all of all the things that you did. I got goosebumps. Um, the quick, quick add to that is things are normalized by understanding, right? And so our understanding is usually connected to trauma and 25% minimum, minimum of the planet uh, has mental illness issues, right? And so everybody has mental health. It's important to understand, just like we have physical health, right? We have mental health and physical health. We all have it. So people are like, I don't have mental health. Well, yeah, you know, you, def you definitely do. And then a quarter of us, minimum, I think it's probably more like a third, have mental illness. And it can be simple. Some of us have eczema on our skin. Some of us have OCD. Some of us are deeply bipolar. Some of us have paranoid schizophrenia. Some of us are medicated. Some of us are not. And in the sectors I work in, it is very, very, very high on the scale because we don't understand through capitalistic structures how to cope or to deal with people who identify as mentally ill. We just don't know what to do. We panic. Right. And we're like, this is not our problem. You are making me uncomfortable. And therefore people get discarded. And I have three different diagnoses personally. And until I was comfortable admitting them and sharing them, I couldn't truly be in my own power. And funnily enough, they calm right down when I honor them. So I'm like, oh, I'm feeling a little bit manic today. I need to get my breath. I need to take a take a moment and like use the tools that are intrinsic to my body of meditation, maybe some stretching, lots and lots of water, hydrate like crazy. And then I can approach the problems. In the lens of indigenous, it's so incredibly important. Um, on the East Coast, my mom's grandpa was uh, Mi'kmaq or Mi'kmaq Indian uh, from Nova Scotia and the Maritime Provinces. And that puts me a very small percentage on the ancestral scale, of course, and not something I identify as, but something I identify with. And those are two very important distinctions, right? When people are like claiming 
status or saying, I, I, I identify with this and I research and understand it and then I am in service to it? What does it look like to have true reconciliation in our, in our places that we live in our communities? And I'll, I'll tell you just a really quick and funny anecdote. I jumped online and I was posting a culinary position for one of my locations. And I said, heavy preference for a BIPOC person. Heavy preference, I reiterated it. And people lost their minds. You can't do that. I can't really what well, I just did and I will continue to and my leadership my kitchen that runs these thousand meals a day is run by an indigenous woman and 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 like we build these structures and have done so for 10 years that focus on women of color in the center it's like you literally can't and we will proceed with legal action against you so of course I know the legal structure and I was like I as an individual haven't identified which venue this is <laughs> or where that's going to be and I'm stating my own personal preference, not as a company. It's important to know that these are my personal views, not shared by the companies that I represent. And people just lost their minds. I'm like, did you want this job? Is it like as a white woman or dude, did you, did you want this job? Like, no, I'm a programmer. I'm like, cool, well, maybe just calm down. It's the guilt mirrored back. If the fact that we have to preference and center indigenous and black and brown voices is true, then people who do not participate in the system and are part of oppression are fucking furious with themselves. They can't cope. That's what you see. The rage isn't actually a lot of the time racism. It's fear and the lack of the ability to admit guilt. So anyway, I. I think that those things are important because as we look um, to how we solve things, we have to understand where the other side, so the other side that they is coming from to try and meet them in some sort of a place to grow together. As you guys have said a hundred times today, people support what they co-create. How do you get everybody to the table? Food's a really, really good Trojan horse. The best of all Trojan horses. Um, thank you, Mark. Uh, there's two questions on the chat I would like to, to, to share with you. Um, one from Ciara, Kiaran, I'm sorry, don't pronounce it well. Um, how do we get past the institutionalized mentality of the key holders, powers that be, right? So that's one question. And the other one is from Eleni, how do we get more people to care like we do? Those two things can be intrinsic. They can, they can run together, right? Again, so let's, let's center in the, in the center of this, people support what they co-create, right? When we saw Black Lives Matter erupt this year, whoo, black tiles were rampant. The internet blacked out. White people that don't even know any black people were putting up black tiles. It was amazing, right? What are the tools? We refuse to admit that the tools are the tools. Bernie, most people didn't even know who Bernie was and they're posting them in a meme today. Imagine if those people had voted for him. Imagine if everybody who ingested a Bernie meme or now, like, imagine if they had voted for Bernie. We would have Bernie as president. You know what the world would look like with Bernie as president? So TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook, and these social pieces did that with this meme. 60-year-olds to 6-year-olds now know exactly who Bernie and his mittens are. We would be crazy to not engage these systems. This is how we do it. This is how people digest information. TikTok activism is critical. People are like, really, dude? Like, isn't that for dances? I'm like, no, this is where everybody is. You have to access them where they are. And now if we access them where they are and we say, this is what Monsanto and this is what Cisco and this is what GFS do. Cisco is a logistics and legal company. They provide food from others at a profit and then sue you if you don't pay. That's their entire business model. If we ask them, to strictly provide food in this particular region, which I can deal with. I buy $2 million worth of stuff a year. I will only buy from sustainable organic line caught X, X, Y, and Z. If I provide them with those parameters, they have to meet those parameters or I won't buy from them. They don't care. They'll buy from there. People are like, oh no, they just, they will only buy products that will like strip mine and like do this. No, if everybody became aware that corn manufactured as poison, that soy manufactured as poison, that saturated fats, that sugar, all, if we became aware of this as a collective, which we are becoming aware of, we would stop purchasing it. 
Whole Foods didn't come out of nowhere. There's a collective understanding around this stuff and we're growing and Victoria nailed it. He's like, it's been this long. We have to have some patience. And the problems are so urgent, we have to slow down. It's really important to remember that because as activists, we will freak the fuck out. And when we do, everybody around us kind of goes, if we can slow down and say to them, hey, this is for you. Your mental health is directly tied to your belly. And when you put too much sugar or too much caffeine or too much fat in there, your insecurity and anxiety peaks. I want you to be safe and I want you to be calm. Okay, where are the products that are created with those things? You start to take a step back slowly and you come on board. Institutionalization, so important. Get white people off boards. Get white people out of the C-suite. You know, I take steps back from all of my governing boards and allow the vote and the majority to happen through people in the communities that serve us. Just get out. You've had your time. Didn't work. White dudes, it's over. Charles and I can do work in holding space for others, right? Do a little bit of like, here's the tools. We got your back. Like, we'll continue to do the work. But ultimately, when we look at the boards of the Unilevers, et cetera, of the world, and we're like, some tokenism here, but hold the companies to a higher standard. And then the last thing that I'll share is run. Run for office. Absolutely do and support the hell out of your friends. This group right here, can you imagine if this group was in the Senate? What happens then? Holy shit. Like democracy truly does work in part if the right people participate in it. They have to participate. I hope that's helpful. I get a little fired up. Appreciate the warmth of your fire, Mark, um, and the words you you share. All right, is there any other question? Um, I'd love to give it out to anyone who wants to share. Or I could or ask another question to, to Mark. I just want to double click on Donna and throw energy that way. Absolutely run in Houston. We know all kinds of people in Houston. Please, please run. <laughs> Charles, like... Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, understanding that we have, we, this is a marathon, not a sprint. I really appreciate it as well, uh, Victoria's uh, perspective on this earlier. Um, we're really truly, as, as, as a species, as a civilization, just coming to a certain kind of adolescence. We're still not yet mature. We're still not yet wise. We're still just understanding the power of our tools. Um, and it is just a very important time for our generation to, to, to work, to make our lives, refining the tools, refining the protocols, redefining the economies around these tools and these protocols to live a good life. Just like Lucas was sharing earlier in the, in the, in the room of Lucas and Alejo, um, an indigenous um, farmer shared, it's, it's really all about having a good life in the end. Mm. Very much so, man. And I just want to reference because medicine got put into the channel and I, I, I will be very short on it while you can pose a question, but um, psilocybin is 100% a tool for your mental health, for your physical being, for your connectivity to the planet, for your understanding of how things work. It is uh, a key. Um, I am a huge proponent as a sober person of psilocybin and trauma therapy and have been through it personally and also use microdosing as a tool. Um, to reconnect with self when I feel like I'm spiraling and, uh, and heavily endorse this in a way that I wouldn't pretty much any other substance aside from water uh, because I think that regardless of it, it shows you uh, the things that you need to focus on and it's just, it's so powerful and so important. So I advocate heavily for psilocybin and, and mushrooms in general. Um, so yeah, thank you for centering that. Whoever put that in the, the chat earlier, I, I care deeply about it. Max for president. Can I share one thing? Of course. Please. I just, I remember while Mark was talking that last summer we went to, um, to this festival where Vivian Westwood was having a, a talk and she talked about these two, um, she made this game, this kind of like uh, card game where she like, 
would look at different products and then she would say it was basically red and, and green cards and the red cards said like bad for the environment bad for the economy and the green card said uh, good for the environment good for the economy economy and like this is this is stuck with me ever since and like i feel like when i try to like i try to ignore the prices on products and just think for myself like do i do i believe that this product is, is good for the environment and then in the current situation it might be good for my economy for myself to pick the cheapest option but if i was to think in the bigger picture what really would be good for the economy would be good for the planet mm -hmm. so i've just been using this ever since to kind of a indicator for myself to kind of like put extra thought into all my also when we had a talk earlier the priority was like this you vote with your money and we have been tricked into actually voting against our own priorities by picking the cheapest option when we go to restaurants or all this stuff so i feel like this this idea that Vivian Westwood came up with is just it's it's very like black and white which things usually aren't but like it's it's just a very easy system uh, I think yeah can I ask you guys to do something while you're here on stage can I demonstrate something for you with each other really quickly that, that proves your point will you stay with me on stage real quick because there's two of you right now I don't think anybody else has two yeah, yeah. You yeah. Two. <laughs> yeah cool all right so the I want you to do this thing and this is, this is how we've been so hardwired. So just as an example to everybody, all right? <clears throat> one of you turn to the other and one close their hand. Whoever it feels natural to, close your hand. Okay. Okay, let's, let's all right, let's, the, the young lady on the left, you keep your hand closed. And sir, what I'm gonna get you to do is open yours, both of them, and get yourself prepared. Now keep your fist closed as tight as you can on the, on the left-hand side, yeah. As close as tight as you can, like you're holding the most precious resource in the world. All right. And he's going to try and take it from you. He can use anything within his means to try and get that open. He's got 10 seconds when I say go. Anything. All right. With don't hurt her. I'm sure you won't. But I'm going to say go. And you have 10 seconds to get that out of her hand. Are you ready? Go. <laughs> Eight, seven, six. Five. It looks like you're going to fail. So let's just go ahead and say that you're going to fail. Yeah. Now, if you could, with your fist closed, turn to me for a second, and I'm going to try and get it open. Would you mind opening your hand for me? Mm -hmm. Could you do that for me? Would you mind oh. opening it? Thank you. I appreciate you. Oh, was that the, was that the trick? We're hardwired to be oh. aggressive. That was taught to me in Alcatraz last year. Uh, and we were doing a TEDx in Alcatraz, literally with prisoners. And uh, Arun Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi's grandson, taught me that trick. And he had me do it with him in front of a bunch of prisoners. And I was like, I don't wanna break this old man, but I'll break this old man to get in his hand. That's where my head went, Gandhi's grandson. I'm like, I'll break it, I'll, I'll get this. We are hardwired because of the system of competition, keeping up with the Joneses. What do I need? I need more, I need better, I need faster, I need to be cooler. Our entire system is built on it. We don't need shit. We need water, a little bit of food, and a lot of compassion in each other. And so everything that you say, I just wanted to reiterate your points back to you. They are critical thinking. Consumption is the basis of capitalism. <laughs> You two take it easy over there. Cameras will be off soon enough. It's the, it's the backbone of it. If we stop consuming and we start looking at buying a t-shirt versus 50, buying a piece of clothing, where are we buying our things? What are we consuming? Do I need 700 grams? Do I need, do I need a tomahawk steak? I did, nobody needs a tomahawk steak. Seven or eight people could share one. It's delicious, but nobody needs that. And our addiction to all of the things. I need a package today. I didn't get a package today. What, what's why well, didn't get a package today? My serotonin's not going off. I did. I deserve a reward. We are all Pavlov's dog to Amazon. It's fucking crazy. And the richest men on the planet are white dudes who don't give a shit about anything. 
but hypothetical numbers in a bank account that they feed off of watching grow. They could solve everything tomorrow. Tomorrow they could solve it, one of them. And we don't hold them to a higher standard, we worship them. Elon Musk is a genius. No, he's fucking not. No, he's not. He's not even kind of a genius. He's a relentless narcissist that has surrounded himself with the smartest people. There's nothing even fucking clever about the man aside from his ostentatious privilege. If there was something special about him, he would take a stand tomorrow and say, I'm gonna buy every first responder in America a house. That's fucking special. I wanna go to Mars as an escape plan? It's disgusting. The fact that we follow these morons on Instagram, that we retweet their things, that we care about them in any way is such a significant indicator of how much we've failed. They are just awful. I could probably tell you what I really think after this, if you want. <laughs> um, thank you for engaging in that exercise with me. I have to go. Sending you all love and light. And very easy to find. Don't tell Elon, Elon Musk where I live, please. Uh, and I look forward to connecting with you all in the future. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate your voice and your heart. My pleasure, brother. <laughs> wow. Um, all right. Um, well, let's take a little breath before deciding what to do next. Is that okay? Just a little three breaths. Let's take three collective breaths, right? And another one. Let all those words and wisdom sink in. Well, so grateful for what has been transpiring here. I know we're past the time, but there's still about um, about 50 of us here. So, um, I mean, this is supposedly the after party, right? Um, so uh, we're already officially in the after party time. Um, super happy also to follow anything that wants to bubble up. If anyone feels like a little corn about to pop and wants to share something, please feel free to, um, to unmute and, and share. Um, but then, yeah, if anyone has any ideas, thoughts, prompts, reflections, um, and going to, uh, um, you know, surfacing everything that we've uh, heard and you know, the powerful shells from, shares from, from Mark, um, and, uh, and, and all the hosts, uh, feel free to, to participate. <laughs> Victoria asks, yeah, we'd love to hear if anyone learned, some, learned something today. <laughs> what did you learn? Yeah, that's a beautiful prompt. And I smile because I feel like we've all learned so much, uh, but. I can say that I, I didn't get to really fully engage in any of the rooms yet, um, but just hearing the summaries, I know there's a lot bubbling under the surface and like taking it all in still. So I don't think I could like regurgitate any of it yet and say what I've learned, but I know there's definitely a lot to be learned from all this information for sure. I just need to let it sink in. <laughs> Can I just do a, a quick um, moment of gratitude for um, Natalie and Donna and Ruthie for, well, I mean, y'all have just, y'all have done such a great job with this unconference and the planning team and all of the patrons, old and new, um, and to all of our special guests and the people in the, <laughs> Nicole and Jason holding down the fort in the intermission. Um, and Mark for doing the keynote at the end, and also Charles for holding the space for us for the third time. This is just, I love the unconference. It's, su it's such a great, um, it's such a great way to share ideas and get inspired in new ways. And um, Charles, we are, I think I can speak for all of us in that we are so grateful for you. 
I wouldn't be here without you all. So it's it's a collective. I'm just facilitating for you all to co-create this magic um, and and to be together. And so yeah, appreciate your words, Katie, especially. Again, uh, Natalie, Donna, Ruth in particular, also E, Esmeralda, who's done uh, so much work in the back and all of you um, preparing your rooms. Again, so much love for that. Um, so is it, a lo is it an after party or a love fest that we're gonna do now? <laughs> it sounds like a love fest. We're both, we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of should, we, should we come off YouTube if we're gonna do after party? Um, yeah, let's, we can, I think, get off YouTube